What is up, you guys? It's time for more controversial thoughts. I got lots of fun stuff to talk about today. Um, if you saw my last video, I shared my own fatty acid markers. So I'm going to screen share those and go over my linoleic acid, stearic acid, palmitic acid, and make some comments about omega-3 and omega-6 synthesis that are relevant to low linoleic acid, high stearic acid diets. And this will be really cool. So check this out. So if you are listening on my podcast, this is a video that will be on Instagram and YouTube. These are my um, essential fatty acid uh, levels in my red blood cells. I shared this previously. You can see my linoleic acid is 5.3%. This is an 18 carbon omega-6 polyunsaturated fat. And you can also see that my stearic acid is 19%, which is pretty interesting. So you'll also notice that my palmitic acid is on the low end of normal. Palmitic acid being higher in the red blood cells is a marker of insulin resistance, metabolic unhealth. Uh, stearic acid is probably high because I eat a lot of suet and fire starter, which we're coming out with soon from hardened soil. It'll be next week. Super exciting. But look at how low my linoleic acid is. That's because I don't have a lot of linoleic acid in my food. I only eat grass-fed beef and beef fat. I haven't been doing eggs recently as I've been uh, doing an experiment. And I certainly don't eat uh, chicken or pork these days. I don't think those are horrible for everybody, but as you will hear in an upcoming podcast with Brad Marshall, there definitely are instances of people uh, like Emmy who have had weight loss stalls that have improved significantly when they really lower linoleic acid and increase stearic acid. We will talk later in this little mini podcast about why decreasing linoleic acid is important. If you've listened to my previous videos, you will know that linoleic acid appears to make our fat cells very insulin sensitive, which sounds like a good thing until you realize that an insulin sensitive fat cell grows and gets bigger. and You don't want bigger fat cells. Next week on Tuesday, I've got a podcast that I just recorded today with Ben Beekman. It's two hours long. It's amazing. And we talked all about metabolic health and insulin resistance. We agree on most things. We had a little friendly debate as well. Ben is an amazing guy. You guys will love this podcast. The other thing I want to mention about this, uh, the omega-3 fatty acids in that profile, and I'll screen share those again in a moment, is that if you look at my omega-3s, they're pretty robust. I do not supplement with fish oil. And as I have talked about previously, I don't think it's a good idea to supplement with fish oil. Most of it's highly oxidized. I talked about that in the previous Controversial Thoughts video. And you don't need that much omega-3 in my opinion. Look at my omega-3s. My alpha linolenic acid, which is actually present in animal fat, is pretty good. Look at how high my EPA is. My DPA and my DHA are pretty darn good. I don't take a fish oil supplement. I don't even eat eggs. I don't eat salmon. I don't eat fish. Why is this so good? Because as you'll show, see in a second, without a bunch of linoleic acid, without a bunch of these omega-6s to prevent the formation, these omega-3s can be synthesized just fine from alpha linoleic acid found in animal fat. There's also EPA in animal fat, as well as DPA and DHA that are preformed. But look, 7.3% are my omega-3s, and I do not take fish oil. I don't eat eggs. I don't eat salmon. This is all from ruminant fat. And it's because this linoleic acid is not so high that it blocks it. So I will show you the importance of this. The omega-6 pathway and the omega-3 pathway are linked. Alpha linolenic acid occurs in things like flax seeds and plants, but it also occurs in animal fat. Here is EPA and here is DHA. Here is linoleic acid. And you see that these are linked. There's a desaturase, which adds a double bond. Then there's an elongase, which adds two carbons. Then there's a desaturase, which adds a double bond. Then there's an elongase and another elongase. And you go from 18 to 20 to 22 carbons. And you go from two double bonds to three double bonds, two, four double bonds into hexanoic acid. Linoleic acid, two double bonds. Do you desaturase? You get three double bonds. You do an elongase, you get 20 carbons. Desaturase, four double bonds. Elongase, 22 carbons, um, like that. You can see that number of uh, D double bonds is next to the molecule. So alpha linolenic, uh, I might have misspoken, is three double bonds. Steridonic, these four, five double bonds in EPA, six double bonds in docosahexanoic acid. That's a desaturase and elongase thing. Now, if you have lots of linoleic acid, it prevents this process on the omega-3 side. 
which is why you don't want lots of linoleic acid in addition to keeping your fat cells insulin sensitive and allowing them to grow and become hypertrophic, which is probably the precursor to them becoming disordered, inflamed, and spewing out a whole bunch of free fatty acids, which you don't want, which probably create metabolic dysfunction in general. I've been talking about it a lot recently. So having less linoleic acid allows ALA to be converted to EPA and EPA to be converted to DHA, which is probably why my, uh, my omega-3s look just fine and I'm not eating fish oil, but I'm getting ALA and animal meat and fat and I'm getting lots of EPA and DHA there as well. So I will also show you guys, and if you noticed, I definitely have a lot of screens open on my computer. That is my, my MO. This is from... Uh, a great paper on the fatty acid profile and antioxidant content in grass-fed and grain-fed beef. I'm not really going to compare grass and grain. I just want to show you that in general, grass-fed beef has more stearic acid. This is C18. You can see it going down here. Um, most of the analyses show significantly more stearic acid in, than grain-fed beef, but also that linolenic acid, 18 carbon, omega-3, three double bonds, is present in uh, animal fat as well. And it's probably the precursor for some of that EPA that I'm seeing because I'm not eating a lot of linoleic acid. I also get a lot of questions about CLA. CLA is conjugated linoleic acid. It's an isomer of linoleic acid. It's not quite the same as this one though. Traditional linoleic acid has double bonds at the nine and 12 position, I believe. And most CLA has double bonds at the positions of nine and 11. Now, does this matter? Mm, not a whole lot. I think it's important to note that with CLA, the, the amount in red meat is very low. Some have suggested that it's beneficial. I'm gonna show you a paper showing that excess supplementation with CLA can still lead to oxidation, which we would expect because it's a polyunsaturated fatty acid. But here is that chain uh, linking of the omega-6 and omega-3 metabolism again. And later in this paper, they have a little bit of the metabolism of linoleic acid, cis-9, cis-12, 18 carbons, two, um, rumenic acid, which is an isomer of CLA right here, cis-9, trans-11, 18, two double bonds, CLA. It's also known as rumenic acid. This happens in the rumen of uh, ruminants, like cows and sheep. Humans can't do this. You also get vaccinic acid, which is trans-11, uh, monounsaturated, 18 carbons. And then you get stearic acid, which is one of the reasons that animal fat, especially from ruminants, is so high in stearic acid. They can make linoleic acid and stearic acid we can't do this. We store linoleic acid. That's a bad thing, generally speaking, in my opinion. Ruminants can make stearic acid in their fat, which is why they don't really accumulate it in the way humans do. But eating monogastric animals like chicken and pork that's been fed lots of corn and soy, if you eat a lot of the fat, it could be a significant contributor to the amount of linoleic acid in your diet. Is it the main problem? Probably not for most people, but it can be for some people. And I think that that can be a hurdle if there is stalled weight loss in many of those situations. So I want to show you a paper with CLA, I don't think we should be supplementing with CLA. I think we should just be eating like our ancestors and eating nose to tail. If you guys need help with that, you can always check us out at Heart and Soil, heartandsoil.co, heartandsoil.co to get desiccated organs. <laughs> but look at this one. A diet rich in CLA and butter increases lipid peroxidation, but does not affect atherosclerotic inflammatory or diabetic risk markers in young healthy men. Basically, they supplemented them with super physiologic amounts of CLA. Um, they gave them 115 grams per day of CLA rich fat, which may accounted to 5.5 grams of CLA oil in that, which is a lot of CLA, um, a significant amount. That's probably in addition to some linoleic acid. And they found that it resulted in increased peroxidation measured as an 83% higher eight isoprostaglandin F2, which is also known as F2 isoprostane concentration compared with the control. And that was a P of less than 0 0.00001, pretty significant. So you shouldn't be supplementing with CLA, but if you're eating real food, it's not going to be a problem because it's a smaller amount than linoleic acid. It occurs naturally because ruminants make those conversions between linoleic acid and conjugated linoleic acid, but it's essentially an isomer of linoleic acid. It's in such small amounts though, that you shouldn't worry about it. Don't worry about CLA, but don't take a supplement of CLA because polyunsaturated fats are not stable. <laughs> You don't want these in your diet in excess amounts because they hold open the adipocytes. They hold adipocytes open by making them insulin sensitive. We don't believe you, Paul. Show us evidence that linoleic acid or polyunsaturated fats make adipocytes insulin sensitive. Gladly. And it'll be in the podcast with Ben Beekman as well. Really cool podcast here. 
Diet Fat, not podcast, really cool paper here. Diet Fat Composition Alters Membrane Phospholipid Composition. Imagine that. If you eat more linoleic acid, your phospholipid composition is going to be more linoleic acid. Insulin binding and glucose metabolism in adipocytes from control and diabetic animals. This is a mouse model. But as I've said before, it's important to note that in a lot of these trials, we are looking at mitochondrial electron transport chain physiology, and we are looking at insulin binding physiology, which is pretty much conserved between species, all the way up from C. elegans to humans. So this is probably a place where animal models are good. Some animal models are bad, but this is pretty interesting and probably pretty consistent among humans. So feeding the high polyunsaturated to saturated, that is the PS diet, to diabetic, to diabetic animals, increased membrane linoleic acid content. It also does that in humans. And it prevented decreased uh, observed in arachidonic acid of membrane phospholipids. The PS diet, meaning the polyunsaturated to saturated fat high diet, was associated with increased insulin binding in non-diabetic animals, but did not change the amount of insulin bound by cells from diabetic animals. Now you're saying, that's good. We want insulin to bind, right? Except you don't want insulin to bind to your fat cells because insulin sensitive fat cells are fat cells that are growing. So what this is pretty clearly showing is that when you feed animals, which have the same physiology at the level of their fat cells in terms of insulin, high di diets high in polyunsaturated to fat, polyunsaturated fat to saturated fat, what you get is insulin binding that is increased and fat cells that are growing. So you can read the rest of this abstract. The rates of insulin stimulated glucose transport, oxidation and lipogenesis were lower for cells from diabetic as compared to control animals. However, that's because they're insulin resistant. However, feeding a high polyunsaturated saturated fat diet significantly improved rates for all three of these functions. Now, that means that it, they're saying it's improved, but what they're having here is insulin is binding to the fat cells and making more glucose disposal. You can take someone and they will be insulin sensitive if you feed them polyunsaturated fats until they're not. And the reason this happens is because those polyunsaturated fats are allowing those fat cells to fill up and they get bigger and bigger and bigger, just like the fat cells in this experiment. And when the fat cells get so big, then they become diseased, and then it becomes problematic for humans or animals. When the fat cells get so hypertrophic that they're leaking out free fatty acids, essentially the button on the genes bursts and they're releasing inflammatory mediators and free fatty acids despite the signaling of insulin, and therein lies metabolic dysfunction. So the reason this can be so confusing to people is in controlled trials, in the short term, if you give someone polyunsaturated fats or animals polyunsaturated fats, they will look like they're more insulin sensitive because they are. Because polyunsaturated fats make your adipocytes more insulin sensitive, which means you can stuff more fat and more glucose into your adipocytes. But all the while, your adipocytes are expanding and expanding and expanding, which is why, as when I talk about with Ben Beekman on this upcoming podcast next week, insulin sensitivity is not the marker you wanna think about. You wanna think about expanding fat cells. You don't want your fat cells to be expanding. You have to understand this physiology very well to really glean, to really dissect what's going on here and why studies showing in the short term that administration of polyunsaturated fats are very misleading. If you look at short-term administration of polyunsaturated fats in humans, you will find improvements in insulin sensitivity as they get fatter. As adipocytes hypertrophy, they get bigger and bigger and bigger and eventually they can't get any bigger and they start to burst. The button on the genes goes pop and then they start spewing out free fatty acids, inflammatory mediators like 4-HNE, 4-hydroxynonanol, which is derived from linoleic acid, ceramide 1-phosphate, which I talked to Ben Beekman about on the podcast, listen next week, and then you get metabolic dysfunction. So people get, they're more insulin sensitive until they get full-blown diabetes, until you get frank metabolic dysfunction. So know what's happening in your adipocytes. Are your adipocytes growing or are they shrinking? Which one do you want? I want shrinking adipocytes. The way to get that is with saturated fat. That's animal fat that's in animals. It's a signal that we've been hunting and that we're successful. And then your adipocytes won't grow. They won't hypertrophy. That is what stearic acid is about. You can get it in stearic, in, in suet. You can get it in fire starter. And you want nutrients in general that will give you the ability to have a healthy metabolism. How do you get those? Eat nose to tail. Eat organs or desiccated organ supplements. Check us out, Hard and Soil, if you need those. Happy to help with that. If not, get the fresh ones. They're great too heartandsoil.co. All right, one more study here that really shows this. Let me actually go to the previous one and I will show you the insulin binding assays. And you can see, if you really are into this stuff, you can see total specific bound insulin. You can see that the control with the higher 
Polyunsaturated saturated ratio binds more insulin. It is more insulin sensitive. It is growing, right? You can see glucose disposal, glucose transported in animals. It's more in the control with a higher polyunsaturated ratio. And it's more in the diabetics with higher polyunsaturated, meaning you're binding more insulin and you're stuffing more glucose into cells. You have to be really careful with this because it looks confusing. Glucose transported, insulin bound. You can see control, higher polyunsaturated ratio. This is fat cell growth, you guys. Fat cells are growing when you feed them more polyunsaturated fatty acids. You don't want this. But it looks confusing in the short term if you listen to people who are arguing this theory that don't fully understand the model. Last one, I showed this one the other day. This is my new favorite freaking study in the whole world. I just need to like post this everywhere. This is a controlled six month trial in the People's Republic of China. This is probably the only place they could do this. Maybe I'll get censored for saying that. It's a three arm, two center, randomized, parallel group controlled feeding trial, meaning that these adults aged 18 to 35 years with a body mass index of less than 28, they're fairly lean, got all of their meals provided for them for six months. This is one of the best feeding trials I've ever seen in my whole life. All of the diets were isocaloric, okay? There was a lower fat, higher carb diet with 20% fat, 66% carbohydrates, a moderate fat, moderate carbohydrate diet with 30% fat, 56% carbohydrates, and a higher fat, lower carb diet with 40% fat, 46% carbohydrates. Protein was held constant at 14% of the energy. This is six months. All food and beverages were provided for the six month interval. This has never been done. This is amazing. 307 participants, men and women. And what they found was that before the study, they did a dietary recall to estimate how many calories men and women needed. So these were isocaloric. All the diets were isocaloric with macronutrient ratios that were different. You can see here the construction of all the diets. Men were 2,100, women were 1,700. Now it's interesting to note that as the fat increased, they increased soybean oil. <laughs> That's what they did to increase the fat. With fats, soybean oil, the most consumed edible oil in China, um, rich in unsaturated fatty acids, which I'm sure everybody thought was super healthy, being the way they introduced this. So what you basically have here are three diets with increasing amounts of soybean oil. It's very similar to the mouse study. Protein is held constant, but you have more polyunsaturated fat as you decrease carbs, okay? Isocaloric. Now, the little hiccup in this study is that everybody lost weight because nobody was getting enough calories. But who lost the least amount of weight? Who do you think lost the least amount of weight? The people that had more polyunsaturated fat. Because the polyunsaturated fat is causing those fat cells to stay open and to accumulate fat. Body weight change, waist circumference, this is the sort of the light orange line, high fat, low carb. This is the most soybean oil. This one is moderate soybean oil. This blue line is the lowest soybean oil. Over six months, statistically significant differences in weight loss between all these groups. You can see that pretty clear. Those who had the least soybean oil lost the most weight. Linoleic acid, polyunsaturated fats are causing your fat cells to stay open and to actually accumulate fat. I have to look at these error bars again. Maybe not all of these differences are statistically significant, depending whether they're standard error of the mean or not, but there's a clear trend here. And this one is a very clear trend, even with these. Those who had the least saturated, excuse me, the least polyunsaturated fat lost the most weight. You can see other metrics in this paper. It's a darn good study showing us the exact, exact physiology that I was talking about before. If you have lots of polyunsaturated fat in your diet, whether it's fish oil, whether it's linoleic acid, whether it's conjugated linoleic acid from supplements, don't do that, your fat cells will remain open. If your fat cells remain open, your fat cells grow when they see insulin. So you can decrease insulin by doing low carb, but you also need to shut the door so that your fat cells don't grow. You don't want your fat cells growing. I've shown this repeatedly in animal studies. It's been shown over and over. Saturated fat, especially stearic acid, causes fat cells to shrink in these adipocytes, these visceral adipose tissue in animal models. Even in athymic nude mice, which is a model for breast cancer, or DBDB mice, which is a model for obesity because they're essentially have the leptin receptor that is broken. So really interesting stuff with all those studies. A couple more here that I wanna share with you guys before I wrap this one up. Two things, 
There is some really interesting data on stearic acid and breast cancer metastases in animal models. We can't be sure till we actually move to humans, but check this out. Dietary stearate reduces human breast cancer metastases burden in athiamic newton mice. These are the same mice in which stearic acid also leads to lower visceral fat and corn oil and oleic acid safflower oil lead to more visceral fat. But if you check this study out, you'll see that stearic acid, which is prevalent in animal fat, suet, cacao butter, had an anti-metastatic effect. Isn't that interesting? But wait a minute, saturated fats are what are always vilified. Why are we told that? Bad science. Now, you guys know, you're probably familiar with these charts that I've shown in the past, looking at the consumption of various macronutrients in the Western diet and correlating these macronutrients with diabetes prevalence in America. So I'll share a couple of these real quick, and then I'll show you what happens in Japan, and they look very similar. This is from Jeff Knob. shout out to him. He gave me permission to share this again. And you can see that since 1960, the consumption of sugar and sweeteners went up and then it's gone down since 1997. Grains up and then down since 1997. We're still getting fatter, but what's this red line? That's vegetable oil. Vegetable oil is consistently increasing despite all this. Meat is increasing too, but if you've listened to my other videos, you know that that's chicken, not red meat. Red meat's going down. Now, why do we matter? Why do we matter? Why does this matter at all? This matters because this is happening. These are similar timeframes. The rate of diabetes is massively increasing. Uh, the rate of obesity is massively increasing. The rate of chronic disease is massively increasing. So if you look at just the correlations, we can't draw causative inference. Looks like uh, I'm not so convinced that it's the carbohydrates that are driving metabolic dysfunction in this country. Again, I'm talking about this with Ben. We have a nice friendly debate. It's a great podcast coming out next week. But I wanna show you guys some data from Japan in a study that one of my friends on Instagram sent me. Here is the study. Medicines and vegetable oils as hidden causes of cardiovascular disease and diabetes. That is an awesome title. I think that's an amazing title. I freaking love that. Now, this is done in, there's a study done here in Japan and you can actually see the, um, the intake of various foods and how it affects their obesity and other chronic disease. Okay, let me find it. So, Right, here it is. This looks a lot like the one in the US. Diabetes, way up. This is 1950 to 2010 in China, Japan. This is trends in nutrient intake and diabetes prevalence in Japan. Data from the Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare in Japan. There's a website here, right? Diabetics skyrocketing. Hmm, total energy going down. Carbohydrate energy going down. Lipid energy, going up. Now, what they don't show in this paper is the increase in polyunsaturated vegetable oils. But if you look at that data, what is spiking here? Polyunsaturated vegetable oils. Look at this diabetes going through the roof while carbohydrates are being consumed less. So that is an interesting thing that kind of corroborates the American data that I'd shown previously. It's a really interesting paper that also looks at the way that statins, warfarin, and other drugs might be leading to cardiovascular disease. What does warfarin do? Well, Warfarin inhibits the formation of vitamin K. Vitamin K, is that an important vitamin? You bet it is. <laughs> now, warfarin is used as an anticoagulant, but vitamin K is important too. So we can see correlations between warfarin and cardiovascular disease because it's going to prevent your body from the carboxylation step of making vitamin K. Not a good thing. Statins are probably not a good thing either, you guys. Sure, they have pleiotropic effects, but what other negative effects do they have? Okay, so in summary, You can get omega-3s from animal fats. You don't need fish oil. You don't need krill oil. You don't need to supplement with CLA. If your linoleic acid is very low, you can allow, that will allow your body to turn ALA into EPA and DHA. There's another previous study I've talked about in vegetarians where they gave them flax seeds. They didn't convert any of that ALA into EPA and DHA. I'll show you this one real quickly. The bioavailability of alpha linolenic acid in subjects after ingestion of three different forms of flax seeds. Mm, maybe don't eat flax seeds, you guys. Not a good source of omega-3s. Tons of lignans and phytoestrogens and other things as well. In summary, ingestion of flax oil and mill flax seeds has delivered significant levels of ALA, whereas whole flax seeds did not. Whole seed and oil preparations induce GI side effects within four weeks. 
These were severe enough to induce withdrawal of some subjects. No one withdrew from the group that ingested flaxseed meal. But if you look at the levels here, levels of EPA and DHA did not increase. No significant increase was detected in plasma EPA and DHA in any of the flax-fed groups. Interestingly, ALA is packaged with a significant amount of linoleic acid in flax seeds. And in this study, you don't know how much linoleic acid people were getting in their diet. But my suspicion is that if you get your linoleic acid low enough at a biological level, that's ancestrally consistent, you can make ALA into EPA and DHA just fine. Um, and I think it's all about getting that linoleic acid low, getting a ceric acid high by eating nose to tail, getting organs, getting suet, eating like your ancestors, not your doctor. So hope that's all helpful. CLA can be peroxidated. You don't want that. You don't want tons of that. Small amounts in your food. Don't worry about that. Polyunsaturated fats affect the adipocyte. They make it grow. It's more insulin sensitive, which means it grows. This is interesting physiology. Getting lots of those things is a bad thing. You want your insulin, you want your adipocytes to be insulin resistant. Eating like your ancestors will do that. So hope that's all helpful, you guys. This is a fun video to make. I like thinking about this stuff. Check us out, heartandsoil.co. If you need more nose to tail nourishment in your life, if you're getting organs already, shoot me an email, drpaul, drpaul, heartandsoilsupplements.com. Let me know what you're thinking. Ask me questions. I got, like I said, awesome podcast with Ben Beekman coming next week, but we've got awesome, exciting things happening with Heart and Soil. Fire starters coming next week. Gut and Digestion's coming next week. And Blood Builder is coming really soon. We're going to have five products, beef organs, bone marrow and liver, gut and digestion, fire starter. I said fire starter like six times. Anyway, you get the idea. We're doing amazing things, hoping you get these nutrients in your diet by eating nose to tail. Thanks, guys. Stay radical.